Good evening fellow Liberal Democrats. I'm Sal Brinton and I'm President of the party and on my right, your left, I have Joe Swinson and Ed Davey is on my left. Um, this is I think their 11th hustings in a very short space of time but what's really interesting is we think this is the first ever online leadership hustings of any political party in the UK and it's good that it's the Liberal Democrats that have started with that. And I'm sure that there are many both old and new members uh, joining us today. Uh, and I want to thank you all by attending. And we know from webinars, people will join us during the evening. If friends say that they're sorry they missed it, this will go up on YouTube. The whole, record, whole event tonight's being recorded. Um, and I just want to say a couple of other words about the format. Each candidate will start with six minutes of an opening statement. Um, they had to be selected by lot for every single hustings across the country on the 30th of May and Ed is going to start for us tonight followed by Joe. We're then going to have 70 minutes of questions and then at the end Joe will give us a two minute summary and then Ed will give his two minute summary. Um, we've asked for questions. You have been extraordinary. <laughs> we've so far had 2,370 people register to join us tonight and questions are approaching 500. And I particularly want to thank my aides um, for tonight, Adam, my chief of staff, um, Audrey Eager, who has been overall responsible for arranging the hustings, and Savannah, my Hansard scholar, who have been going through your 500 questions to try and group them. Now this means, unfortunately, we may get one or two supplementaries in, but we've had to plan them. And you know, I apologize in advance, we've got room, I think, for seven groups of questions. That means we're very unlikely to get to your particular question, but we've tried to group the most popular themes. Um, I've also got to remind you that we couldn't take any questions that were directed at just one candidate, so some fell by the wayside that way. Um, if you want to hashtag as the evening progresses, please do so. Remember to use hashtag Lib Dem Leadership and hashtag Lib Dem Surge. So without any further delay, I'm going to ask Ed to address us now. Thanks, so. Sal. This isn't just the first online hustings, it's the first leadership hustings in over 100 years when we've just beaten both Labour and the Conservatives in a UK-wide election. We are back in the game. But we've had some tough years, the 2015-2017 general elections, the appalling 2016 referendum, but we fought our way back, thanks to you. I know you l loved delivering all those leaflets. Um, but we've got to win. Uh, I believe my campaign record shows how we can win. Uh, for example, when I first got elected, I wasn't a target seat, I wasn't supposed to win, but I did because we built a great team of local councillor campaigners and we had a simple message, Ed for Education. And I think simple messages are the way to go. Stop Brexit, it's working really well, even in its Anglo-Saxon version. But my major concern for making sure our party does win is that Brexit aside, I'm not sure if people know what we stand for these days. Under Paddy, our late great friend, he used to obsess about our brand image. He said he'd sell his grandmother for a brand image for the party. Uh, he didn't... Back with you shortly. And then Alex just take whatever time you need. Okay. Back on. OK, I'm afraid the gremlins got in there. Um, so Ed was stopped in the middle of his speech. I'm going to go back to Ed. Over to you again. Thank you. I was saying that under Paddy, he ensured we got our brand image back and we were known as the party of education. I think my political history shows that we could become the party of the environment. My political journey began before I joined the Liberal Democrats as an environment campaigner. I'd read Seeing Green by Jonathan Porritt, and in Seeing Green I was shocked that we were poisoning our home. And Paddy was the politician who spoke to me about how we could save our planet and I joined the party back in 1989. So I was immensely happy when I was made Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change in 2012. And for three years, I ran for renewables. I nearly quadrupled Britain's green power. Britain became the world leader in offshore wind. And then in Europe, and then in Europe, I campaigned for three years to lead Europe, so we got some really ambitious climate change targets in 28 countries. And through Europe, we were able to lead in the United Nations, and that ultimately resulted in the Climate Change Treaty in Paris. So I know climate politics, 
at a time when, frankly, climate change is the most pressing issue for our world. Um, but I'm not just a, a proud tree hugger. I'm a liberal heart, head and soul, uh, whether it's from sorry, equality... Sorry, sorry. Okay, I have no idea what's going on with this. I think it's a Wi-Fi. I'm really sorry. Um, <clears throat> okay, back on. So I was, had been talking about my environmental credentials, uh, my plans to decarbonise capitalism, to switch money from polluting technologies to green technologies, but I was also saying that I, I'm not just a proud tree hugger. Um, I'm a liberal heart, head and soul, uh, whether it's equality or internationalism, human rights or uh, local democracy. I believe our liberal de democrat values are as vital as ever, but they're also under threat, whether it's from the far left or the far right, whether it's from Islamophobia or anti-Semitism, whether it's from transphobia or xenophobia. Uh, these are terrifying times. And it's time for Liberals to stand up, particularly to the peddlers of fear and division like Tommy Robinson and Boris Johnson. Um, I believe that we can defeat these people, and I'm record shows that I will not flinch from standing up against them. For example, when I move the amendment to get rid of the Tories' vile homophobic Section 28, or when I campaign to get my constituent released from Guantanamo Bay for five years, um, it wasn't a vote winner to stand up for an alleged Islamic terrorist, but I couldn't have been more proud when we got Bisher out of Guantanamo Bay. So for me, my record is about liberalism and what I've achieved, it's about climate change and it's about winning campaigns. But for me, uh, my uh, stance is also a personal one. Um, I lost both my parents as a child, I was a young carer for three years, and that obviously affects you. Um, and it shaped my life. Now with Emily, my wife, we have two wonderful children, of course, they're shaping our lives, particularly my son, John, who has some very special needs that need a lot of care. So I've had some personal challenges to overcome, but I think they've made me stronger, but they've also taught me the importance of caring. And I think we need to make sure that our party is the caring party. Yes, I want to lead a party that stops Brexit, that tackles the climate emergency, but I want us to be compassionate too. And I believe Britain needs us to do that, so we can heal the divisions caused by nationalism, caused by Brexit. As leader, I want our party to reach out to leave communities. I want our party, with our generous heart and our liberal spirit, to give our country hope again. Ed, thank you very much, and apologies for the interruptions. Joe, over to you now. Well, delighted to be here as part of this online webinar hustings. I'm running to be leader of the Liberal Democrats because I think we have a golden opportunity in front of us right now. The, the country is crying out for a liberal alternative to take on the nationalism and the populism, that rising tide under the likes of Johnson and Farage. We need a liberal movement to beat that. The answer to nationalism is liberalism. And that's why liberal democrats need to be at the heart of that movement. Now, we've been having some very good days in the party recently. I'm sure you've been celebrating the wonderful election results, watching up, uh, staying up late, watching election night coverage and just cheering. Uh, 16 MEPs, 704 councillor gains, and of course 20,000 new members joining us in the last few weeks. Welcome to every single one of you, and I'm sure some of you are on this webinar tonight. But I wanted to talk to you a bit about my worst day in politics too. Now that wasn't in 2015, the day that I lost my seat, though that was pretty bad, but it was actually a year later, in 2016, the morning after the referendum result and I'd gone to bed in disgust about 4am, it wasn't looking good and then when I turned the television on in the morning it was confirmed that Leave had won and I saw Nigel Farage smiling smugly out of that screen, totally regretted having such a big television screen and then he said something I'll never forget, he said and we won it without a shot being fired. Yesterday, 
was three years to the day since the day that Jo Cox was shot and stabbed, murdered for her political beliefs. And that he would stand there and say that, it's so crass and insensitive, just beggared belief. But this was the same man that had stood in front of that breaking point poster. And that was designed deliberately to sow hate and division across our communities. So that nationalism needs to be stopped. And when Theresa May called the election in 2017, I knew in a heartbeat that I wanted to run, win my seat back and make a more positive liberal case for our future. I've never been one to sit on the sidelines when I was uh, at school. I got involved in campaigning through the body shop, hugely inspired by Anita Roddick and her vision of business as a force for good. At university, I was president of my whole of residence, campaigning to get internet access in all of the rooms. As a new MP, when I was elected at the age of 25, I took up the cause of excessive packaging and got manufacturers to change the behaviour on certain products. And as a minister, in the business department, I took on powerful vested interests to stand up for vulnerable people, clamping down on payday lenders and also on rogue employers who weren't properly paying people the national minimum wage. Now we have the fight of our lives to secure and then win a people's vote to stop Brexit. I've been very involved in that people's vote campaign from the beginning and have been the Lib Dem face of that campaign. I spoke in, in Parliament Square at that amazing march that I know so many of you will have been at on the 23rd of March this year when hundreds of thousands of people marched through the streets of London. I think in order to win that people's vote, we need not only to make that obvious economic case, we need to make the emotional case too. About the three million people in our country who are EU citizens from other parts of the EU, our friends, our neighbours, people who work in our public services. We need to talk about the way that the EU has secured peace in our continent and here in our own United Kingdom. But whether it's Brexit or tackling the climate emergency or taking on nationalism and populism, just saying no is not enough. We have to give people a yes. We have to paint a more positive future, a vision of how the world can be better, a world where we have a zero carbon future, where we've transformed the way that we live, work and travel, a world where technology is harnessed to work for us and help to reduce inequalities rather than entrench them, a world where we change our economy so that it works for people and for planet. We have a huge opportunity to transform our society our economy and our politics. So let's do it. Let's do it now. Let's do it together. Thanks, Joe. Right, we're going to come on to questions and um, I can see from the post-it notes that are being scribbled on, we are getting some, some further questions. Um, the first two are, um, one is on their vision for the party, which we'll come on to in a second. The second group is We've called it reaching out beyond Brexit, but it's not about Brexit. It's about all the other key things as well. So if you think you've got a, a question on that that you want to add, uh, I'm going to read out one question and then a couple of little supplementaries within it. And we may not get to your further supplementaries because we don't have very much time. Now, the first question is from Sandy Layton from Wimbledon, who asks, as we're going through massive changes, what's your vision for the future? And Matt Campbell from Bristol asks, what is the plain language story we can tell that explains everywhere the party has been and where it's going? And Joe, we're going to start with you. So in terms of the vision, I think in the end of my remarks, I was starting to talk about that there. I think for too long, our economy has not worked for too many people. We're an incredibly rich country, yet we have huge poverty and inequality. And we're literally killing our planet. If we don't change direction, then the whole future is negatively impacted. So I have a vision that we have an economy that is reshaped to work in the long term for people and planet and harness the technological revolution in order to do that. And I can give you policy ideas of how we would make business have a social purpose and improve reporting on 
uh, measures to do with how businesses treat their workforce, uh, climate risk reporting. There's a whole range of policies that can help to deliver that vision. But that is what I want to see. An economy where every single individual is supported to live with dignity, with a decent home and the ability to uh, provide for themselves and their family. In terms of the language, the plain language story about our party, I mean, our party has such an amazing history, 30 years as the Liberal Democrats, and of course, so much prior heritage, both with the strong Liberal tradition over more than a century, and of course, the Social Democratic tradition too from the Labour Party. So the Liberal Democrats are about people coming together in the national interest to create a more positive vision of the future. We have often been a party that people have written off, they've underestimated, and yet we fought back. Um, Paddy famously talked about when he took over as leader, he was taking on a party that at some point was pulling an asterisk in the opinion polls, which meant there was no identifiable support. Happily, whichever of us uh, wins this leadership election, we are uh, going to take on a party in great health with fantastic results behind us. And it is that positive future that I think we need to be able to build on. I think this is no longer about rescuing us from poll ratings of 8%. This is about how we really break through 20%. How do we become uh, absolutely mainstream in a world where the fault line in British politics is about nationalism? And the answer to that, as I said before, is liberalism. Thanks. Ed? Well, the vision has, first of all, got to get over Brexit. We've got to stop Brexit and then we've got to heal the divisions that Brexit's caused and that caused Brexit itself. Uh, and that is about tackling inequality and fairness, particularly between regions. But what sort of society do you want to build? Well, the green agenda, I think, is fundamental to it. We have to decarbonise a whole society, our economy, uh, to create the green jobs of the future. And if, in that vision, we can talk about the impact on people's health, particularly on things like air pollution, and the way that better public transport and easier cycling and so on can improve our society, I think that is a real winner. I would want to couple it with it, the idea that we could be the best educated and best trained nation in the world within a decade, because I think investing in people is fundamental too. In terms of our story where we've been, I think we should really be really proud of the things we've achieved. On freedom, things like same-sex marriage, for example, We've given people much more personal freedom through what we have achieved as a party. And on fairness, you know, taking the low paid out of tax altogether, bringing what the pupil premium, if you remember, where we've made, made, I think, the biggest impact on helping the most disadvantaged children in our society. I think it's really important that a fair policy we can be proud of. And of course, on the green agenda, you know, let's remember, it's been the Liberal Democrats who've been the powerhouse behind the green power revolution. In terms of where we're going, I think we need to take all that agenda on, that green agenda, that freedom agenda, and that fairness agenda. But I would wrap it all together in a political reform agenda. Our politics is not working. And when we have influence, hopefully as the majority government, when we have influence, we've got to remember that we've got to fix Britain's broken politics. And for me, that's obviously electoral reform and PR but it's also devolving power, so we have much stronger local government. It's fixing the House of Commons, which is such a appalling uh, and weak chamber. So a range of measures. But above all, as we fix our broken political system, we've got to make sure that the voice of ordinary people is heard better, not just heard and listened to, but has much more ability to participate and shape the decision-making. And that is the liberal society I think we can achieve. I think we will achieve because I think we're going to win. So I'm going to pick up on the plain speaking, uh, plain language story and just ask each of you very quickly in turn, you're knocking on a door and there's someone who's a Brexit voter and what are you going to say to them? I'm going to start with Joe and then come to Ed. So your very quick response as if I'm that person. So good evening. Why would I vote for the Liberal Democrats? Well, do you like what we do in your local area? Your lived-in councillors have been delivering for you. Um, and tell me why you feel the way that you do about Brexit. What was it for you that made you make that decision? And then I would listen, because I don't think we're going to be able to change people's minds if we don't engage with them and listen to what they're saying. Good. 
Well, in this area, I've noticed that we have not enough police. There's a real problem with crime in our area. And Liberal Democrats have been fighting to get more police. I've talked to local head teachers. We don't have enough money for our schools, and they're having to make cuts. And you go to the local hospital, and the waiting is there, and the, the failure to link with the local authority's social care is a huge problem. Liberal Democrats are championing for these public services across the country, but particularly in your area. So come and vote for us, and we'll win those for you. Great. Thank you both very much. Now, we're going to move on to the next... Um, question now, or the grouping, which is about things other than Brexit, because we have had hundreds of questions on lots of different policies, and we certainly aren't going to get into all of those. But Emma Fitzpatrick from Basingstoke asks, other than Brexit, what would be your three main priorities and why would you choose these over other areas? And there's been quite a lot of interest as well about Treasury and big fiscal issues. So Jonathan Boskill asks, Give us some plans for how to deal with a deficit and the national debt. Worried that 7% of public spend goes towards just servicing the debt. Uh, and um, do you accept that austerity was the wrong economic policy in 2010? Ed, first for you. My three priorities would be uh, greening up our society and on the back of that an economic plan which would deal with uh, inequality and finally, education to underpin it all. And why those three? Well, if we don't green our society, we won't have a society. We absolutely have to tackle the climate emergency. And I've got bags full of policies and experience to lead on that. But on the economy, which would fit into that, because you need a green economy, we've got to make sure that we're saying to those regions in our country that have been left behind, that as a result, part of the vote to leave, that in a Liberal Democrat uh, economic plan, they would get investment. And we should use the Remain dividend when we've stopped Brexit to invest in public transport and skills and also give significant funds to local authorities and local communities so they can decide what they want to spend money on, but actually have real resources so they can do it. And beyond the decarbonising and this strong economic plan with a big transfer to the regions, I would like to see investment in education. Um, I think the policy we had under Paddy Ashdown of a penny on income tax for education showed what a priority Liberal Democrats have to education. And it's the one way that you can both improve your economy long term, but give real chances in life for people and really pursue that equality of opportunity, that social justice piece, which is fundamental to Liberal Democrats. But your other question about debt is absolutely crucial because you can't do all these things, invest in education, invest in the regions, if you don't have the money. Um, and the money comes from two places. It comes from growing the economy and it comes from decisions about tax and spend. I think if we stop Brexit, you'll have a, that remain dividend and I think you will see the economy grow. And if you make sensible investments, you can get returns to those investments and that, that will see the debt as a proportion of national income decline over time. So growth is the key thing, and getting the right sustainable growth is the important way of doing it. On the tax and spend side, of course there's always spending that is wasteful that you can cut back. We should always look for value for money. But we've also got to be honest with people. Sometimes taxes will have to go up. And I think we should not be afraid to say that. We've led the way in the past of making sensible, modest tax rise proposals uh, like we did in 2017, the pay on income tax for the National Health Service and Social Care. And I think we should look at those ideas again alongside our growth agenda. Um, austerity in 2010? Well, remember we were borrowing £400 million pounds a day. Uh, something had to be reined in. And Labour's budget, the Alistair Darling budget that he said he would have done, was actually rather similar the ones that the coalition government did. Our failure was to not make that point at the time. And actually, if we had not been there, austerity would have been far, far worse. George Osborne wants to cut back far more quickly, and we stopped that. George Osborne wanted to cut far more deeply, particularly welfare benefits, and we stopped that. Now, again, our failure was not to tell people that. What I do think now, though, there is no case for austerity measures at all. We should have stopped austerity, the Tories should have stopped austerity a few years ago, 
and we should say austerity is abolished under Liberal Democrats. We want to see the Brexit dividend spent, we're prepared to see taxes rise, we want to make sure our vital public services get the investment that they need. And, and I'm afraid when the Tories are talking about huge tax cuts for wealthy pensioners under Boris Johnson, they're the sorts of things we should completely reject. We want a fairer, greener society. Our plans can deliver that. Thanks very much. And Joe. I'll start with those questions about the deficit and austerity. Um, first of all, on the, on the deficit, I mean, the, the best and most important thing to do is to stop Brexit because everything gets so much more difficult in terms of our economy if Brexit goes ahead. So we have the right priority there. In terms of austerity, clearly in 2010, there did need to be some spending constraint. We came in with a, a deficit that in terms of percentage size of our economy was worse than Greece. Uh, but what we did was we delivered roughly Labour spending plans. So I mean, the first thing is I wouldn't take lectures from the Labour Party on this. They were also trying to facil facilitate a Brexit that would give us austerity on stilts. But while being robust when we have attacks from other parties, I think we also do need to reflect on some of the things that we uh, got wrong in coalition. And I've said the bedroom tax would be an example of that. You know, while we made the right strategic decision to go into uh, government, we, we did get some things wrong. And I just think we need to be a bit humble about that and recognise where uh, we didn't win some of the battles that we should have absolutely won. On my three priorities, I would say that the first one is to reshape the uh, economy so it works in the long term for people and planet. So this is a bit of a fundamental re-looking at how the economy works and what it is for. If you think of someone like Jacinda Ardern, who is the uh, Prime Minister, as you know, of New Zealand, she has just said that they are going to change their economy so that it focuses on well-being. And when you start looking at what your economy delivers by those metrics, then I think you start to make some quite different decisions about where spending goes, about what is prioritised. The second priority would be the technological revolution that we are living through. It has got huge potential to help cure disease, uh, deal with the climate emergency, with new technologies, uh, make our lives better in so many ways. And it also brings huge risks. We've seen the privacy issues, the issues in terms of uh, uh, fake news, and this is an area which government really needs to be engaged with. I've been chairing the Lib Dem Technology uh, Commission and we've got a, a range of interesting ideas that we'll be bringing forward in a, a paper in the near future. So uh, I think that tech revolution, we really need to be that party that understands those issues of the future. And then the final priority is political reform. And this is less of a stick it on a leaflet priority, if I'm honest, but more of a strategic priority. Because I think the moment that we're living through now in politics is quite unique. It is one where there's a fracturing of the two-party system and there's a chance to, to try to capture that, to change the way the system works in our politics for good. But in order to do that, we need to find a way to deliver political reform, specifically of our voting system. Now, I think there's organisations like More United where you're already seeing cross-party working on different policy issues. And as well as us obviously having this in our manifesto, I want us to see how we can get this in other party manifestos and get other candidates and other parties backing this. So that if you have the scenario where perhaps there's a, uh, another balanced parliament, there may well be a majority of MPs in favour of changing the voting system. And then we can totally reshape our politics. Great. Thanks very much, Joe. We're now going to move on to questions on climate change and the environment. Again, we had a large number of these, so we've selected three. Um, Daniel Taylor from Wimbledon asks, both Joe and Ed have placed climate change and the environment towards the top of their political agendas. What would be their signature policies to tackle carbon emissions and plastic pollution? Uh, Daniel Nutburn from Swindon says, what measures of success do you feel are important to deliver an economy focused on making us thrive and help us to sustain our planet? So these are all broadly the same theme. And, then, and finally, one a very specific one. What are, your candidate, what are the candidates' views on fracking? Jo, we're going to start with you on this one. Sure. Um, so, uh, I mean, in terms of signature policies uh, on, the, um, on carbon emissions and, and plastic pollution. So, 
I mean, one that I would talk about immediately is climate risk reporting. This is about changing the way in which businesses operate. It's about how investors can have information to know whether they are backing a business that is ultimately not going to do well in the long term because of sustainability reasons, and how they can put their money into greener, lower risk assets. And that flow of money is really important to decarbonise more broadly. We've got a policy paper coming to Autumn Conference and it is full of ideas about how we can decarbonise. On plastic pollution, obviously the government is taking measures which are far too little too late. It's an issue I've been campaigning on since 2007 uh, in terms of excessive packaging. And there's a lot more that can be done by just saying when particular types of single-use plastics, for example, are going to be phased out and creating the incentives for plastic not to be in products that it doesn't need to be in. So, I mean, I would say there's lots of policies. It's not the job of the leader to set each individual policy on this, but I know that the working groups that have been doing this have got some amazing, amazing ideas in that paper, which, of course, conference will decide on. I think Daniel's question about measures of success is really important because you know, until now, we have prioritised GDP growth above everything else, as if that is the only thing that matters, and if we get that right, everything else will flow. Well, actually, if you start looking at different measures, whether it's well-being, whether it's issues of air quality, for example, then you get a different picture of your priorities. And I've been involved in some of the work that's been done to I set up the um, all-party group for well-being economics, for example, um, 10 years ago now. And creating a wider list of indicators of what actually determines whether we have a good life is a very sensible way for the government to be able to track, as I say, things like air quality or you know, commuting time uh, so that we can start to prioritise the actions and the policies that will really make a difference. And then finally on fracking, really straightforward, I'm absolutely against fracking. I think it doesn't have a place in our energy future. And while I know there's some safety uh, reasons and issues that get mentioned, for me it's actually a more fundamental strategic issue. We already have more fossil fuels due to come out of the ground than we can possibly safely use. And so it makes no sense to be starting a whole new industry which will then be uh, required to get return on investment to get more of those fossil fuels out of the ground. So it's just difficult enough doing the transition from the, the fossil fuel industries that we already have without setting a whole new industry up and, and getting that running. So fracking, absolutely not. Thanks very much, Joe. Ed? Well, to tackle carbon emissions, we've got to do two major things. We've got to really push the renewable sector. Um, you heard earlier that we in government made Britain the world leader in offshore wind. I'd like us to be the world leader in tidal power, which we can be. And we need to export these because many other countries would benefit and we need to Remain, reduce the carbon emissions around the world. But in addition to the technologies, which are so exciting, we need to completely change fundamentally our economy. I've talked about decarbonising capitalism. What do I mean by that? We need to go to the pension funds, the stock exchanges, the banks, the debt markets, and force them, by law, by regulation, to have to take account of climate change risk. We need to make them more transparent. They've got to show to investors and and consumers putting money into their pensions, that they are on track to move away from dirty fossil into green technologies, that they are compliant with the Paris Climate Treaty. And I've got a whole set of regulations. I've been talking to people in the city. I even met the Governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, to discuss these types of issues. And that, that would be right at the top of the agenda. And it could be totally transformative, not just for the UK, because 15% of global fossil fuel investment is raised in London, if we can decarbonise our financial institutions, it can affect the whole world as well. So my ideas on decarbonising capitalism, I think, uh, are key things I want to push forward. On plastic bags and plastic generally, we should remember we have a proud record. I was part of the decision to put the 5p on plastic bags, which has seen their reduce that their use reduced dramatically. The Tories didn't like that, we force it through. But that's only the start. We've got to get far more serious about reducing plastic and we've got to use the law, we've got to work with other countries to make sure that plastic you know, almost disappears from our system in the way, some of the appalling way it is used at the moment. 
um, the measures. I go back a long way on this. Um, I remember working with Paddy Ashdown when we were talking about the way that GDP, uh, the normal measure of growth, really is not a good one if you want to take care of your environment. The GDP counts activity which is damaging for the environment and it makes it out to be a good thing. Uh, that's clearly wrong. So we've got to change the fundamental economic measures because they're not measuring what human beings want to be measured, whether it's sustainability or whether it's well-being and happiness of people. And there's an awful lot of literature that we could use on that. I remember back in 1990 reading something by a gentleman called Victor Anderson talking about a whole set of alternative indicators that we could use, which range from everything from the number of birds in our population, which actually is quite a good indicator of biodiversity in a country like Britain, uh, to, to more sophisticated economic measures which would really look at green growth. Finally, the issue of fracking. Um, I'm in favour of a ban. I haven't always been. When I was in government, I was having to work with the Tories who wanted to frack everything. I said at the time they wanted to frack every croquet lawn in the country. They were so keen on fracking and I had to stop them. And the way I did that was by tough regulations. I was extraordinarily worried about the impact on our environment. So I posed a number of regulations, including one uh, related to earth tremors, because when people frack, it can sometimes cause mini earthquakes in the ground. And so I passed a regulation for controls on seismicity. Uh, and that regulation has basically stopped the fracking industry developing in our country. And I'm really proud that the law that I passed and the law that we passed as Liberal Democrats has basically really thwarted the fracking industry here because it really isn't uh, as environmentally friendly as they uh, make out. But beyond that, the reason why, uh, other reasons why I've changed my mind is part of the success of our policy on renewables. When we were investing in offshore wind, we had no idea that our policies would be as successful as they've been. The cost of offshore wind has fallen dramatically thanks to Liberal Democrat policies. And what does that mean? Well, it means fundamentally we're not going to need as much gas as we thought just a few years ago. This is great for our environment and it means we won't need so much gas. So the idea that we need to frack is a nonsense. And the final thing, my favourite environment NGO, I love Greenpeace, I love Friends of the Earth, but my favourite one is Carbon Tracker Initiative. They've done some analysis which shows if you look around the world, we've already discovered four or five times the amount of oil, gas and coal that we could safely burn four or five times. And if we were to burn that, we would really go beyond damaging climate change, way beyond the 1.5 degrees that we have to keep within. So given we now we've got that, we've got that very clear analysis, we should leave a lot of that stuff in the ground. We should disinvest from fossil fuels and reinvest in green technologies. We don't no longer need to frack, we should ban it. Thanks very much. Um, we're moving on to the next group of questions now, which sort of broadly, I'm afraid all the themes are broad, social cohesion, inequality, division in our country. And Valerie Gardner asks, what would the candidates do to address the huge chasms that have opened up between rich and poor, north and south, old and young, remain and leave, white and BME, etc.? And Suzanne Davison uh, from Halton Price and Howden says, the UK seems to be becoming even more divided with strongly held and expressed views at extremes. If we are finally able to avoid Brexit, how would you aim to bring the Brexiters in our population back on board with the EU? And this time it's Ed first. Well, several things to tackle poverty. The first is housing. In my constituency, I do two advice surges every week, have done for years. And the issue that creates grinding poverty for people is unaffordable housing, or quality housing, lack of housing, and we need to have a very strong housing policy to turn that around. And I think when I go across the country, it's housing that really worries uh, people, and where if you've got poor housing, it affects your children's health, it affects your, your mental state, it, it could be really massively impacting on people's um, life chances. And I'm a real believer in council housing. I think the Liberal Democrats should really get behind a major programme of building council houses. And one of the ways we can afford it is we've got very low borrowing costs at the moment, so it's a good moment to invest in housing. 
There's an awful lot of new types of policies working in the private sector that we could do. And I want to look at housing benefit. Because in the old days, 40 years ago, before housing benefit was brought in, the main housing subsidies would go into building bricks and mortar. And it was thought that that was a bad idea, that you would give people more choice through housing benefit rather than investing in the property itself. That hasn't proved to be the case because there's just not enough housing. So I think we may need to reverse that and look at that again to make sure we've got good homes, quality homes that really will help people's lives. Beyond housing, I think education and skills is fundamental to life chances. And we've got to make sure that the more disadvantaged uh, youngsters and children get a much better start in life. And I would focus on the infant years, even the preschool years, to try to see if we can make sure that through strong investment in those areas, we can turn things around. And I would link in particular to that the growing and emerging literature about adverse childhood experiences. There's a number of them. Uh, there's bereavement when people lose their parents, but there's situations when uh, children have parents who've got mental health problems, drug addictions, al alcohol and so on, and a whole range of child abuse for example. And unless we uh, focus a whole range of policies to make sure that children who've had such appalling starts in life get that extra help, we won't really have a fairer equal society. In terms of healing the divisions caused by Brexit, I talked earlier about the need for massive investment in our regions. Um, if you look at regional inequality in the UK, it is appalling. It's the worst in many developed countries. We have two of the ten richest uh, regions in Northern Europe, in Britain, London, the South East. We have six of the ten poorest regions in our country as well. That is a massive regional divide. It is a stain on our economy and our society. And it's one of the reasons why Brexit happened, why People voted leave. And if we do not address that with huge amounts of resources, yes, with things like restructuring our economy around the green economy I've talked about, but also using the remain dividend, the extra money we'd have by staying in the EU, using that positively for big investments, transport and skills investment. We were up in uh, Yorkshire and Lancashire at the weekend for hustings, and the Trans Pennine uh, Railway getting a fast link could have a massive impact actually on the northern economies. So there are projects we could get behind, as well as giving more resources to local communities, devolving political power, so towns and cities and villages even could decide their future backed by more resources. And unless we do that, we won't heal the divisions in our society. Thanks. Joe. When I was on question time a few weeks ago, the last question that we were asked was, why is everybody so angry all of the time? Which I thought was a very good question. Politics at the moment is kind of horrible, isn't it? I mean, it's so divided, and in all those different ways that were set out in the question, and, and probably some other ways too. In Scotland, we've been living through this even longer. We had a very divisive independence referendum in 2014, and in a sense, the bad news is that five years on from that, those divisions are still very much at the, the top of, of Scottish politics. And so I think we really have a job on our hands to get back to a level of public debate that was the norm when I was starting out in my political life, where you just respect the person on the other side. I often say that we need to rediscover the art of disagreeing well. And whether that's uh, in discussions with people who voted to leave, whether it's people in different political parties, you know, if somebody can have a genuinely held different point of view to yourself and you can both respect each other's position, even if you feel very strongly about it. One book that I read, which I think is, explains part of what's driving this, is called 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now by Jaron Lanier. Very much recommend. I didn't quite manage to delete my social media accounts, but I did pause my Twitter and Insta accounts for three months when I was on maternity leave last year. And I really found that helped me to reflect on how we use social media, also how much time we spend on social media, um, but, but the way in which likes and engagements are driven by things that capture people's attention 
And of course, we are quicker in our emotions to rise to anger and hatred. And that's why you get clickbait. That's why you get shocking content. That's why the fake news, whether it was in the American presidential election or in, in Brexit, rises to the top and is more likely to be shared. I think we are not just experiencing those economic divisions, we're experiencing cultural divisions too. And one of my favourite pieces of research about the Brexit vote uh, is that a factor that predicts whether or not you voted Brexit even more than your income is your answer to the question, do you think it is more important that children should be considerate or well behaved? And you know, as the mother of two small children, I sometimes think either considerate or well behaved would be wonderful, thank you very much. Um, but although those two words seem very similar, uh, actually we all instinctively know when we think about it for a second, which one is the more Brexity, and this by the way holds true for Trump voters in America too. And it's a cultural outlook of liberal versus authoritarian, uh, open versus closed. And I think we need to take this very seriously, this division in our country. In terms of how we actually start to address it, I, I talked about how we need to reshape our economy, so our economy works for us, for people and planet. And I could tell you that I want the objectives for our economy to be tackling the climate emergency, to be dealing with poverty and inequality and making sure there's good health and well-being for everyone in our country. But what I think we need to do actually is have a national conversation about those issues, to say what should the purpose of our economy be? and engage people, whether it's through citizens' assemblies or other mechanisms, but engage people in that so that we can come to a shared view of where we're going. Because so much in our society is little groups all disagreeing with each other and we need to re rediscover that shared sense of purpose as a country. Joe, thank you very much indeed. Um, we're moving on to the next group now, which is Brexit and EU reform. Um, David Wilkinson from Lib Dems in Europe asks, Whilst we're staying in the EU is undoubtedly a good idea for the benefit of all, what steps would you take to improve the way the EU operates and what in particular should we focus on changing to make its work there transparent to citizens? Patricia Connell from Westminster says, what are your views concerning voting rights for EU citizens abroad in another referendum or a people's vote? And Neil McCulloch from Oxford Western Abingdon asks, if we do sadly leave the EU, will you commit to a people's vote to rejoin? I think we'll start with that, Joe. Great. So, um, there's lots of things that obviously should be different about the way the EU operates. You know, it doesn't make sense for it to go to the European Parliament, to go to Strasbourg once a month and sort of decamp everybody there. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, I mean, I do, I've been to my fair share of European Council meetings, as has Ed, you know, the, trying to get 20 different countries to agree on anything, you know, does have its rather cumbersome elements and and sometimes you end up in sort of lowest common denominator and sometimes you have horse trading so i think there's things that we could do to make it work better but i would caution against us making that the core part of our argument because i think this is the, the mistake that david cameron made where he had this renegotiation as if exactly what deal we secured for uh, the benefit system for polish plumbers would make a difference as to whether or not he recommended staying in the eu or not and for me, staying in the EU is just fundamentally strategically important for our country. If we look at the United Kingdom, we look at an uncertain world that we're in. You've got, you know, now Trump in America, it was rather more benign when we had Barack Obama in the White House, but you've got the rise of Putin, you've got China as a very significant player. Where does our strategic interest lie? It is with the 27 other nature, nations of the European Union, where we largely share values, we largely share interests and where we have much more clout and influence as part of a block of 500 million citizens. So I think we should argue for reform, but not get waylaid by it. Yes, I absolutely think EU citizens should be able to vote if, uh, elsewhere if in a people's vote. Um, if we've got, um, uh, you know, we've got a lot that needs to be different about the franchise, I'd want 16 and 17 year olds to be able to vote as well. I also recognise that we will not be in a position to set all of the terms of that, so we will argue for that. But if we're voting on a people's vote, ultimately we're going to vote to secure a people's vote, even if it's not the perfect people's vote. Um, and, uh, and then on the final question, which was, 
if we leave. So I think the first job we will have to do if we have left the EU is in the years and years of negotiations that follow, be fighting tooth and nail, day in, day out, for the closest possible relationship with the European Union, to have the strongest alignment of regulations and the best trade relationships, the best diplomatic relationships. We'll have to significantly ramp up our, uh, our embassies and uh, the people that we have in all of the different European capitals. So there's a massive job to be done there before I think the issue of rejoining actually comes about because we will not leave overnight. And the closer we have those relationships, then the easier it will be for us to rejoin. And obviously that is where our future lies. Our best future has to lie in the European Union. Okay, thank you very much, Ed. You know, I always think it's odd that people think uh, Europe should be perfect. No tier of government is perfect. Your local council, do you think that's perfect? Parliament isn't perfect, and nor is the European Union. And as Liberal Democrats, we always want to reform government, don't we? We want to reform our local councils, make it more democratic, more transparent. We certainly want to do that with Westminster, uh, reform the electoral system and reform the appalling, undemocratic House of Lords. Um, and we want to do that with Europe. Um, there's a whole range of things we could do at the European Union level. Um, for example, we could make sure that the way it regulates takes into account the needs of micro companies. I did quite a lot of this when I was a business minister uh, to try to deregulate for, for micro companies who didn't need some of the regulations which was appropriate for the large companies. That might seem a small issue, but we saved uh, small companies huge amounts of money and that shows that you know, a liberal agenda on the economy can work really well. Um, I'd like to go uh, further. I think that one of the things that I showed as a Minister of Europe, that if you really engage with other member states, you can do huge amounts uh, that when ministers don't go, they fail. So as a business minister, I started up something called the Like-Minded Group for Growth. And we achieved, for example, the EU Career Free Trade Agreement. We made real strides in improving the single market. These are really important things which Liberal Democrats did and we took Europe forward by working with other countries. And when I became Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change, I formed the Green Growth Group. And by working with other countries, by actively going there, going around Europe, we managed to get far more ambitious climate targets than anyone had thought. So, yes, it's about reforming, but it's also about making Europe work for our country and showing that to people. And I believe we have a track record. For my sins, I've sat on more European councils than any Liberal Democrat in history. So I have a sort of insight into how you can improve the workings of Europe. On the voting rights, of course, we should have those uh, voting rights for people in referendums and elections. You know, we believe in extending the franchise, don't we? We need, for example, to allow 16-year-olds the right to vote uh, in all elections. And that's been a Liberal Democrat um, ambition. And if we're going to ensure that we have a fair, fairness, uh, we need to Im involve these people who've been excluded under the Conservatives in these really important uh, votes that impact their lives. If it impacts their lives, they should have a voice. In terms of rejoining, well, if we uh, have a Brexit, which I'm not sure we're going to, I'm still very confident that we can stop Brexit and we will need that. If we do, um, I don't think we should give up the fight because the agreement that would then have to be uh, discussed is going to take years. And I think attitudes will change during that period. So I do not think we should drop the idea of a people's vote if Boris, God help us, uh, takes us out later this year. Um, clearly the key thing is to stop that, but even if he does, we sh should not give up the fight. Because I don't think we will have fully left, we will not have had uh, the Brexit. So let's not give up uh, uh, quickly. And I think we should be the party still of a people's vote. It's too important, not just for our economy, but for peace in our world, for tackling climate change. We must be the pro-European party forever. Thanks very much. Uh, now, I've got a supplementary, which is quite long, but I'm keen on quick fire answers, okay. which is <laughs> the referendum. This is from Toby MacDonald. The referendum has created a tension between representative and direct democracy, with some of the Tories even suggesting that the Queen should prorogue Parliament. 
Do you have a theory of sovereignty that will guide your leadership? And I'm going to start with Ed and then Drew. Well, first of all, we've got to stop the notion of, of the next Prime Minister being able to prorogue Parliament. That would be a democratic <coughs> outrage. And I think uh, we would need to have a vote of no confidence in the Prime Minister that put that forward. And I believe we could win that, given how outrageous it would be. And I think we should then try to form a government of national unity in order to get uh, a referendum uh, passed. Um, but the question is about sovereignty. Um, I would like a written constitution. You know, uh, many years ago, Liberal Democrats actually produced Britain's first ever written constitution. It was our party that did that. It, the first words were, we the people. Uh, and, you know, I believe that is the, the road to really have a much better notion of what sovereignty is about. Sovereignty at the moment, if you listen to the Tories, about, is really about um, whoever's got the, the most votes in Parliament. That's not real sovereignty. Sovereignty should lie separate uh, from the, the people who have the power at that particular moment. My version of, 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 of liberal democracy is to control the powerful people, including the government of the day, and the only way you do that is through a written constitution, which we should champion. Jo? I entirely agree with Ed, we should have that written constitution. Um, I, I'm, yeah, I kind of feel like I have a bit of veteran, I don't know how many referendums uh, in, uh, in, the, in the last few years. Um, and the, they generally haven't been particularly happy experiences. I mean, we did win the one in Scotland, but it, it, was, uh, it was a very painful experience. And I recall that I used to hear people like Ken Clark, people who'd been around in politics for a long time, talking about why referendums were such a bad idea, and listen to the arguments, but I don't think I'd quite emotionally processed them in the way that I absolutely have now. Um, I think after this is Brexit issue is resolved, we need, uh, after a little bit of time, uh, we need a proper conversation in the country about how we use referendums in any way in our democracy. Because it seems to me that there's a good way of doing referendums, which is kind of the way that it was done in the late 90s in Scotland, uh, where you have a major constitutional change proposed, in that case the setting up of the Scottish Parliament, and you have a genuinely consultative process. There was a constitutional convention in Scotland that went on over years, involving all the political parties, uh, the faith groups, uh, civil society groups, trade unions, business community to discuss and come to uh, a sort of agreed position where there's basically a consensus but it's a big constitutional change so you still want the confirmation from the people and then you have a referendum to deliver that and that seems quite a sensible way of doing uh, using a referendum as opposed to how they've perhaps been used certainly by the Conservatives in this case, as a, as a way of settling a very contentious issue or as a way of um, you know, trying to get your own internal party management sorted out. And that, to me, does not seem uh, sensible because uh, that, that just needs to huge, huge upheaval. I mean, this one was billed as an advisory referendum, um, uh, and given all of the legal problems uh, that, it, that it has been had with it in terms of the uh, spending limits and, and breaches and the... Um, ongoing National Crime Agency uh, you know, investigation. Uh, you know, had, it, had it not been only advisory, then there's an argument that it, it would have been ruled uh, out of order in any event uh, by now. So, so I think part of this issue is how we use referendums, and, uh, and I think sparingly and only after that groundwork has been done should be ultimately the answer for the future. Our immediate priority, obviously, being to secure this people's vote because the country's in crisis and this is the best way out of it. Thanks, Joe. Now we're moving on to the next group, which is sort of broadly a lot of questions on, on these themes. Future Coalition, Cross-Party Alliance, Red Lines. So Sarah Smith from Oxfordshire asks, as leader, would you be willing to negotiate with other groups in Parliament if it would ensure the furtherance of Lib Dem policy, for example, a second referendum? Ivan from Huntingdon says, assuming we get a sufficient number of seats in the next general election to be candidates for another coalition, what would your stance be? And thirdly, Paul Haviland from Bournemouth asks, coalition building is at the heart of Lib Dem philosophy, but are there red lines which you would not cross when considering potential coalition partners? And we're starting with Ed on this one. Well, absolutely, we need to work cross-party uh, to stop Brexit, uh, in government and outside government, frankly. 
Um, there are other issues which do that as well, particularly I would say the climate emergency. So working cross-party in any form of legislature, whether it's parliament, whether it's council, whatever, that is natural to Liberal Democrats and we as pluralists should make sure we're at the head of trying to bring people together for the goals that we aspire to uh, and sharing those values with others, which of course we do. So cross-party working absolutely. Coalition, a bit more challenging. Um, I first of all would want to make clear that I think we should aim to be at least the largest party. You know, we've just done fantastic well, the local electorals and the Europeans. We are ahead in some of the polls. I don't think there should be any cap on our ambitions at the moment. And under me, I want us to really go for it and try to win outright. There's no reason why we shouldn't try this time round. Politics is in a completely different state. You know, we've never had the Tory party and Labour party split at the same time in such a deep way and on an issue where we've got a con con clear lead, where we've been consistent, where we've been principled and it is the issue of the day. So I think we should be very confident and more ambitious than we've been for, I think, for many elections. However, let me assume for the sake of this answer that we are still the third party, hopefully overtaking the SNP, that would be very good for us. Um, I don't think, under the current leadership and the expected leadership of the two parties, uh, two other parties, we could do a deal. I don't think we could have a coalition or either, even a supply and confidence arrangement like the DUP have. Um, basically, the Tory leader and the Labour leader, Mr Corbyn, are in favour of Brexit. That is a fundamental difference and I can't see how we could bridge that gap. And it's not just on Brexit, is it? Those two parties have gone to the extremes. We've got a very extreme right-wing government, particularly if Boris becomes the Prime Minister. I don't think we have anything in common with Boris Johnson and the Johnson Tory party. Equally, under Corbyn, we have an extremely left-wing leader. Very difficult to see how we could have a coalition. But I don't think we should worry about that. Sometimes it's right to stay in opposition and to use your votes in an intelligent way. And in a balanced parliament, I prefer balanced to hung by the way, uh, in a balanced parliament we've shown that we can make a huge difference and we could vote issue by issue, we could hold them to account and I think that should be a message when the coalition comes up in the election campaign for the next leaders, it always does. We shouldn't be talking about coalitions, we should be talking about the Liberal Democrats and saying the more you vote for Liberal Democrats, the more Liberal Democrat policies you will get because we can fight uh, for them either as the largest party or party of government maybe, or by having a huge number of Liberal Democrat MPs. So, you know, I think we should be very careful about coalition in the current state of British politics. Um, in terms of red lines for a future one, because, you know, I actually am in favour of coalitions, you just got to make sure you've got the right par partner. Uh, I do believe that our commitment to electoral reform shows that normally, in normal circumstances, we should be looking to work with others to uh, further our ends. But there are some red lines for me. Europe is one. Uh, I don't see how we could work with people who are anti-Europe. I think that's a fundamental division now in, in British politics and don't think we can compromise on that. Uh, I think the climate emergency is so important. If there are people in other parties who are unwilling to take the action that's required to deal with the climate emergency, I think we need to, uh, we can't, can't deal with them. And I think we shouldn't go back to austerity policies. We should be clear we believe in growth and fairness. The final thing is on electoral reform. Uh, this has always been the issue when you get to coalition making for the Democrats. And the question is, where would you place that? I place it very, very high, but I would want to make sure that whatever the outcome of those negotiations, should we ever get to that point, is we have PR in local government. Because I believe that's a mistake we've made in the past. We've gone for the top, and sometimes you can't reach that straight away. If you get PR in local government, you can get people used to PR systems like they have in Scotland, like they have in Northern Ireland, and then you can win the long-term argument and win for PR. Thanks very much. Joe. So I'll start with a question about coalition, and would you go into coalition with the others? Well, absolutely not with the Jeremy Corbyn-led Labour Party 
or a hard Brexiteer, insert whichever name wins the contest, uh, Prime Minister from the Conservative Party. Both of those are facilitating and wanting to deliver Brexit, and that is just totally contrary to Liberal Democrat values. So that is just simply off the table. And in terms of red lines, I think it is about making sure that we are getting a people's vote. And I actually think that uh, a sort of formal coalition with, with those parties, given their positions, wouldn't be able to, wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, but uh, that has to be our red line for everything that we do uh, in the coming months while we still have the opportunity to stop Brexit. And I, I on electoral reform, think that it is about using this moment to get that change for our Parliament, our UK Parliament. We've had STV in local government in Scotland since 2007. I mean, across uh, the entire United Kingdom, we've had PR for the European elections since 1999. Uh, and of course, in Scotland and Wales and, uh, uh, and in London, you know, we've got different elements of the additional member system uh, for those different uh, uh, assemblies and parliaments uh, as well. So we already have quite a lot of that in different levels, uh, but the place where it is the most broken is at Westminster. That's where we need to fix. And I just think this moment of the fracturing of those two big parties, if that results in us being able to, uh, at some point in the years to come, uh, be arguing in government uh, and working with others, it has to be delivering electoral reform and I would say that has to be for Westminster. And just on negotiating with others to, uh, to deliver a people's vote, then of course, I mean, I think the Liberal Democrats should be the rallying point for this movement. We are clearly, as a result of those European elections and those local election results, the strongest, most consistent, most obvious party for Remainers. And I want us to be as big as possible. I mean, we have had 20,000 people join us in the last few weeks, our highest ever membership at 105,000. But the 60 million people in our country, and millions of them, are liberal minded. So we need to be reaching out to those people and getting more of them to join us as Liberal Democrat members. And I would say that that is about us existing within a wider movement too, of people who are perhaps not yet Liberal Democrats, or even some people who share some of our values and will not be Liberal Democrats, but we need to be working together. Because when we look at what we're up against, in terms of the likes of Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage and their rise of nationalism and populism, then we as Liberals with a small L as well need to work together. Joe, thank you very much indeed. Um, we're going to move on to the next question, which is sort of about people's trust in the Liberal Democrats and how we define ourselves. Um, Chris Rolls from Seven Oaks, Dartford and Gravesham says, in the last general election, we suffered not only from a lack of media coverage, but also from the media choosing to focus very much on our fringe policies, such as legalising cannabis and therefore losing our main message and our appeal to voters. How do you plan to address this in future uh, so that we can get not only good, sufficient media coverage, but also appropriate reporting of our policies in order to maintain and increase our current appeal to voters? And then a similar theme one from Andrew Starling, who says, I left Labour after researching my own political perspectives and discovering the Liberal Democrats are more attuned to my own values and belief. How will you challenge the wider public's political compass to ensure the Lib Dems stand separately from the alternative parties? Joe, you're first on this one. So, uh, I, I, I think everybody, obviously, uh, is always concerned about media coverage, and it is one of the challenges we have always faced as a party. And uh, I, you know, I, I think I get a lot of media coverage for the party, but we always need to get a lot more. I think policies like legalising cannabis are not actually the biggest problem. I think that does cut through with a lot of people. I think that there's times when the media cover that because it is different and it is distinctive. I also think it's a policy, by the way, that is absolutely right when you look at how badly the current war on drugs is failing in our country. And we're the only ones actually standing up with a very sensible policy to say, let's look at the evidence and let's deal with this problem. Um, you know, as a medical issue when people are addicted to drugs rather than having police resources and criminality for people who are, uh, who are taking cannabis and, and taking resources away from, from other crimes. 
I, I think that we, we need to have a clear vision, we need to have a clear message, we need to be able to express that in an engaging way. In my experience, the way in which you get invited back onto media programmes is by uh, being a guest who they, they, want to, they want to see more of, they want to have uh, back on. But I also think that our social media input is absolutely crucial to this. Now, we've done brilliantly well at this in the European elections. Our digital team, some people might have been aware, um, there was a piece on Sky News about this, uh, were the most effective in terms of bang for ad advertising pound in, in what they uh, got out there, and also very targeted to specific voters. And this is the way in which uh, the, the realm of political communication is changing. You know, more people are like you, watching a bit of politics, you know, probably many of you on a tablet or on a, on a smartphone, uh, uh, possibly as you're you know, doing your commute or, or, or doing other things, and we need to be where people are. Uh, now, we're doing that very well in advertising terms, but we actually, as a party, you know, right the way through, need to get a lot better at that from what happens in local council areas, of course, some of which are doing this brilliantly, and we need to share that to be campaigning on the latest bus route closure, all of those local community issues where you have those community Facebook groups, that is also going to be how we manage to, to reach through. And in terms of the question about um, managing to uh, ensure that we stand separately from the other parties, well, what we've done with Stop Brexit has been to stick to our principles and speak authentically and from the heart because we care about this. And politics, more than ever, is actually about can you make an emotional connection with people. That is what, for all of their faults and the damage of what they're trying to do, that's what people like Nigel Farage do. They, they, they get people on an emotional level. And if we're going to be able to compete with them, we need to be able to have that, that sort of positive emotional uh, alternative that, that you know, speaks to people so that they actually refer to us in the first place. Joe, thank you very much. Ed? Well, in, I've been involved in getting media coverage of the party for over 20 years. Uh, I've been on every media outlet uh, you can name uh, and been on any questions and question time and take programme countless times. And the real way you get your message over is by being really clear and speaking nice, simple messages so that people understand what we stand for. And sometimes the party has been a bit ill-disciplined in the way we've focused our core message. And if you speak about everything, you speak about nothing. So you have to choose the core areas. I spoke about this in my earlier remarks, about the need to make sure our message is much better understood, that people know what we stand for. Clear, <coughs> clearly at the moment, the stop Brexit message should be our lead, must be our lead, is our fantastic lead message for us. I mean, you know, who wouldn't want to remove that? And all its uh, Anglo-Saxon versions I talked about earlier. So stop Brexit would be in the window, must stay in the window. But as leader, I want to make sure we were thinking ahead, thinking about what's the message when we stop Brexit. And therefore, that's why I, in my campaign, have been talking so much about my climate record and the climate policies, because I do think the environment is has raced up the political agenda. We cannot let the Green Party dominate it. We didn't in the past. We were seen as the environment party for many years. And I think we've lost our way a little bit in putting that right at the top of our political messaging. So I would want us to keep going on and on about the environment, not just straightforward on climate change, but air pollution, linking to health, linking to plastic issues and so on. And I think that would help us reach out to new generations of voters, young people, the people who were there on the climate strike, those wonderful young people, and the Extinction Rebellion protests. They should be marching with us. And I think if we make sure our brand is around the environment, we could do extraordinarily well. That doesn't mean we couldn't talk about other issues, of course, and education would be very high on my list. Um, I think, uh, as I've explained earlier, that is one way we could define ourselves. Um, if we did that, messages like legalised cannabis wouldn't get in the way so much if we had that discipline. doesn't mean we shouldn't have policies like that. I, Like Joe, I totally support that policy. It is distinctive, it is right, given the failures of the current war on drugs. But if we have got a much clearer brand, I don't think those policies would get in the way uh, of our overall pitch 
in a, the way they did in the 2017 election. So um, that really is the way forward. And I think um, if we were clear on our core message, a lot of the media coverage that we have had in the past wouldn't be as damaging. Okay, so one supplementary on this, we've had quite a lot in, um, for which I'm very grateful. Is this from Aloka in Lambeth. As a black person in the party, I feel that the, per the party itself isn't diverse enough for the people we're seeking to represent. How would you increase diversity in the party specifically, because quick fire answer please, we're running out of time. What would you do to motivate BME members to run for public office? And we're going to start with Joe and then come to Ed. Well, the first thing we need to do is learn to count and to challenge ourselves. We've now had, I think, 10 hustings across the country, and I mean, this question came up at the first one in London, and as I said then, and it's a bit more difficult to do in a webinar format, but I said, just look around the room. You know, this is central London, and we are not nearly diverse enough as a party. We're not nearly representative enough as a party, given what we're seeking to do. And so we need to be able to understand through monitoring where that issue is, to what extent it's in membership, to what extent it's whether people can get through candidate approvals, selections, you know, you need to understand where the problems are in order to be able to deal with them. And it's an issue I've been working on from the gender perspective in the party since 2001. And we have made significant progress, although we have still got a long way to go. And I think that some of the things that we have done with the Campaign for Gender Balance are now going to be uh, taken forward or braced the campaign for racial equality, which is, of course, such an important movement within our party. I think the other thing that is really important is that this is something for everybody in the party to do. So I think the leader sets the tone, and then at all levels of the party, whether it's at local parties, whether it's in council groups, whether it's just members who are watching this on a webinar, there's a lot we can all do about this. One of the simplest things is to ask people to stand and support them when they do, particularly for underrepresented groups of all sorts. And that can make a huge, huge difference. And the final thing I would say is we need to understand our own privilege. You know, I am a, a woman and I can sometimes experience sexism as a result, but you know, I have the privilege of white skin. You know, I've not been racially abused, abused in the street ever. Um, I've never been stopped and searched by the police. I carry around with me privilege just by virtue of being white and too often it's unseen. I would say to people watching this, if you haven't read the book by Rennie Edder Lodge, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race, please read it. It is eye-opening. We all have a responsibility to understand our own privilege and to listen to people who have different life experiences. Thank you, Ed. Of any sitting Lib Dem MP, I have the most ethnically diverse constituency. I've uh, got a big Tamil population, a lot of Gujaratis, a huge Korean population, uh, a lot of Pakistan, Muslim Pakistanis, a range of uh, different uh, uh, ethnic groups and I've had the privilege of working with them and, and representing them for a long time now and I've got to understand the issues from their side, put my feet in their shoes and for me I've managed to persuade many to stand for council for the Liberal Democrats and you do that by encouraging them personally going out of your way to say that they can do it and we, they will get the support. Uh, last May, I'm sorry, May 2018, I was delighted we got the first ever Korean councillor uh, in Kingston. So I think it's about leadership. It is about the leader taking personal responsibility to make sure that we are far more diverse than we currently are in, in all ways. But I think the, uh, the gender work that Joe and others have done have really taken us forward. But we are really at the very first stage of making sure we have proper representation of our black and ethnic minority communities. So for me, it would be a top priority as leader. I would do the sorts of things I've done in Kingston and it would be uh, a, a key success criteria for me to make sure we, we absolutely sort this one out and sort it out quickly. Right, well, thank you. There is one final question. If you listen to things like any questions, there's always a slightly quirky one. Yeah, so this one, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I haven't got to who asked it. <laughs> no, no, it's okay, it's okay, guys. So previous leaders have danced. Others have run mountain trails. What is it that you two do 
to relax and keep sane. And we're starting with Joe, and then we're having Ed. And this is, a, again, fairly swift, because we're running out of time. Uh, well, I, I am a runner. Uh, I have run three marathons, uh, including one in the middle of the 2017 general election, which was quite bad planning, because obviously we didn't know the general election was going to happen, and I'd already entered the marathon. Uh, so I do enjoy getting out and, uh, and running. And then the other thing is I've got, I've got two small boys, so you know there's kind of nothing better than, you know, kicking a football about or um, you know doing a jigsaw and um, you know I've been trying to help my my youngest to be able to go downstairs safely and he's been rewarding me by wiping snot on my dress so you know sometimes it's the grounding things which actually are the most lovely. Thanks Ed. Yeah well it's my children again uh, you know I went back before I came here home just to see them and uh, my little girl didn't want me to go was bolting the door <laughs> and you know so you know when you have your heartstrings pulled like that you know that any spare time you've got to spend with your children and my wife and uh, what do we do well we go swimming a lot uh, my little boy is quite disabled uh, but in the swimming pool in the water he loves it and he can swim and he loves splashing and we have great fun uh, he's also uh, can ride a tricycle because although he can't walk at least walk unaided uh, he can ride a tricycle and so we've got many videos of John on a tricycle and the tricycle we've developed for him he's got this little seat at the back and so his, his sister sits in it and so we've got lovely videos of John tricycling away uh, with uh, Ellie in the back and you know we tend to go to a lot of national trust properties where they've got nice disabled access and so on and have have fun with that so like Joe it's, it's the family. Thanks both for that. We're going to come to the concluding statements now, and because Ed started earlier, we're going to hear from Joe first, and then Ed. They've only got two minutes each, so Joe, over to you. Even though I've only got two minutes, I'm just going to share something which happened that was prompted by Ed's family story. My uh, my my son was really annoyed at me because I was doing something dreadful, which was um, denying him chocolate ice cream for breakfast. <laughs> and he uh, he stamped his feet and he said, "I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to vote to leave the European Union." <laughs> and I just thought, "Oh goodness, you've been on too many people's vote marches, haven't you?" He's five. Uh, anyway, um, we need a leader, Liberal Democrats, who can cut through on the media, who can reach out to new voters, and who can be a rallying point for our liberal movement. Since the campaign launched. I've been on LBC, Talk Radio, BBC Breakfast, Sky, Channel 4, Radio 2, Newsnight, Good Morning Britain, Question Time, The Mar Programme and The Today Programme twice. And I know all of you have complained at some point on Facebook about the Lib Dems not getting enough coverage. So I am cutting through on the media for our party. And we need someone who will reach out to new voters across the generations, across the country and across traditional party lines. I've lived and worked in Scotland, in Yorkshire and in London. My social media has nearly 70,000 followers and got 3 million impressions in the first few days of the campaign. I can reach out to newer, younger voters on social media. And my non-tribal way of doing politics is just what we need at this time of huge opportunity with the party system fragmenting. So we need that rallying point for our Liberal cause. On the day that I launched my campaign, 1,500 new members joined our party. We are growing. It is wonderful news. We can do this, this huge opportunity that is up for grabs. So we can do it. We can do it together. And I want you to join me. Thanks, Joe. Ed. I have to talk about Ellie after a, a People's Vote March. She kept singing, where's Jeremy Corbyn for weeks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, friends, I don't know whether the Conservative Party are going to have online hostings, um, but they think over the next few weeks they're choosing a Prime Minister. I think you could be choosing a future Prime Minister. Um, I sense the tectonic plates of British politics are shifting. I think the Conservative Party could split if Johnson becomes a leader. With the hard left strengthening their grip on the Labour Party, I think the Labour Party could split. We've already seen lifelong Labour and Tory voters coming to us. And I believe there's a historic opportunity, and I believe I'm the leader who can seize that. And I've sat and negotiated at the Cabinet table, at the EU, at the UN. I've negotiated tough deals. I've had, I think, good political adjustment over many years. 
um, my leadership on climate change in particular, I think that will reach out to many people, people who voted Green, young people. Uh, I think that is the issue of our future and I can lead on that. But my CV for leader has a lot more. I've had huge media coverage over many years um, and when I get on I'm really robust. I've uh, had the best of John Humphreys on more than one occasion. And last year, when I was in any questions, Jonathan Dibbleby had to stop the audience. They were clapping so much. So I can do that. But above all, I have the grit, determination and the vision to lead our party. Um, I think I'm an authority on climate change. I'm an economist. I believe that economic policy that we need will be safe in my hands. So, friends, I think we have a huge liberal task to stop Brexit, to heal our country, to heal the divisions after the nationalism that we've seen in Brexit. I think we can do it. I'm ready for that leadership task. I'm ready to take us into government. Please campaign with me and let's win for liberalism. Thank you, Ed. Well, thank you, both of you. And I mean, it's my privilege to sit between two wonderful people. As president, I have to be absolutely neutral. But I tell you what, either of them as leader, life is not going to be quiet and it's certainly going to be fun. And I think that will be fantastic. We still got two weeks of hustings to go. Um, if you've got questions that you want to ask Ed and Joe personally, the best thing is to go onto their websites. You can find them pretty easily anywhere on social media if you're a Lib Dem. That won't be difficult, will it? Um, so there are no leaflets to hand out at, at the, the physical hustings. There are leaflets, but you can certainly find that. Your votes will land in your inbox on the 1st of July. And we are announcing the results of the last week of July. I think there's another party announcing a certain result around then as well, providing they don't have a coronation. We're clear we're not having a coronation. We have two absolutely excellent candidates and I'm really looking forward to the result. And I just want to end by saying if um, Ed and Joe and I are all looking rather pink, that's actually because there are six of us in a tiny office at HQ with no awesome. air <laughs> and it's very warm. At least the internet didn't go off again. Uh, and so I want to end by thanking the literal behind the camera teams of Alex and Audrey and Adam and Savannah who did some prep work on your over 500 questions for which I'm extremely grateful. This party works because we are so democratic. Thank you for joining us for part of that tonight. Thank Good you night. very much. All right.